Hello, everybody. Uh, good day. Um, thank you for joining us for the What's New in 3 Deck 9. So, uh, my name is David Gagne. I'm a senior engineer with the TASCA Minneapolis, uh, responsible for technical marketing. Uh, today, Jim Hazard, our 3 Deck product manager, will be uh, presenting and giving you an overview uh, of what's new. Uh, if you have any questions, um, we're going to do a Q&A session uh, at the end of the presentation. Uh, you will be free to uh, raise your hand and we can unmute you at that time. Or if you have a question, please just type it into the dialog uh, in this question section. Um, below that, you can type in your question, hit send, and then we'll just keep a tally of uh, any questions that you have. Uh, and then I'll read them out at the end uh, of the presentation and Jim will respond. Okay. Um, before we get started, uh, we have a couple polls that we would like to uh, get some feedback on, just to understand a little bit more about uh, everybody who's participating in the presentation. Um, so the first one is just a question about your industry, and then throughout the presentation, uh, we will um, have a few more polls. So, um, if everybody could just uh, answer what industry best describes you, um, we'd appreciate it. So thank you very much for participating. I'll close the poll now. And Jim, if you'd like to continue with the presentation. Okay, thanks, Dave. Um, Here's the outline of what we're going to talk about. This will be a relatively short webinar, I think probably about half an hour or so. Um, the purpose is to talk about new features in 3 Deck version 9, which was just recently released. Um, however, I will spend a little bit of time just giving some background about what 3 Deck is and what applications there are. Um, often people join these webinars and they've never used 3DEC or have rarely used 3DEC. And so it's useful to just give a little bit of background before I start rolling into the new features. So what is 3DEC? Um, at its heart, it is an assembly of rigid or deformable blocks interacting at contacts. Um, and that's basically it. However, this idea of blocks uh, being deformable or rigid and interacting with each other gives a whole spectrum of possible behaviors here that we can simulate. Um, so on the left, you can imagine something that's mostly a continuum with some small number of joints or fractures or faults in it, um, progressing to something that looks like the middle plot where you maybe have a, a blocky material. In this case, it would be some sort of masonry structure. Um, and then you could also do something that's more like a true discontinuum where you have a whole bunch of pieces moving relative to each other. So we like to call this a hybrid numerical modeling approach because um, it's sort of a combination of discrete elements and continuum. Um, so the discontinuities between the blocks are simulated using a distinct element method. And what this means is it allows the, the blocks to move past each other, to separate, and to also form new contacts. So it's a, it's a true discontinuum uh, in the sense of uh, you know, having the ability to form these new contacts. Um, in between the discontinuities, you can have deformable blocks, and each of these is like a little continuum model. Um, so the continuum part is solved using the finite volume formulation. This is the same as FLAC and FLAC 3D. Um, be aware that this is a little bit different than finite difference. A lot of people just use them interchangeably, but the difference here is that a finite volume formulation allows for an unstructured mesh. And so what you'll see in 3DEC is that often the um, continuum part is full of tetrahedral zones, and this just makes it easy to do that to do the meshing. Like FLAC and FLAC 3D, 3DEC uses an explicit solution scheme. And without going into detail, what this means is that it's a, a time marching scheme where information propagates through the system in a fairly realistic way. Um, we use this approach because it's useful for dynamic solutions where you actually have waves propagating through the system. It is useful for large strain problems um, where you need to update positions and so on. 
Um, and it's also useful when you have highly nonlinear material behavior and you need to track the path of the failure. Okay, so the next few slides are just about applications, things that people use 3 deck for. Um, a lot of these are from our own consultants, but some of them are from uh, other people. So underground mining, you could do mine scale problems like shown over here on the right hand side. You could do smaller scale tunnel scale problems like shown on the left here. This one is some sort of uh, fracturing material supported by rock bolts. Those vertical black lines are the, are the bolts that are providing the support. The colors are showing the stress so you can see how this thing de-stresses close to the excavation and the stresses are shed higher up and the, the bolts are trying to hold it all together. <laughs> Um, again, related to underground mining, caving, fragmentation. Um, people use this to look at uh, fragmentation of, of material, and you can get statistics about fragment size and so on. Um, this is just a fairly simple example of that. Open pit mining. Again, you could do something on the mine scale, like you see in these two plots here, um, showing a, an open pit mine with a bunch of faults in it. You could do something at the bench scale. So this bench here, I don't know, it's probably 40 feet high or 10 meters. Um, this is from our office in Chile where they were looking at a fractured material and what's going to happen when you um, excavate this bench, you know, are you going to get this kind of failure and what kind of disaster is that going to cause for you? <clears throat> um, civil engineering. So this is uh, the top right plot here is uh, subway tunnels in Sweden, I believe. Um, this red area here is a fractured zone where they're interested in the details of what's happening at these tunnel intersections. Um, the bottom plot is a, is a large power cavern in China, I believe. Um, and so what you've got here is a large excavation with some smaller excavations shooting off from that. Um, and then obviously a very fractured rock mass here. Masonry structures, you see a lot of uh, three deck plots of masonry structures, often because they make very beautiful looking plots. Um, so for example, the one on the top right here is some sort of stone vault. The top left is uh, some sort of brick or stone tower subjected to earthquake loading. Um, the bottom plot here is some sort of stone wall with earth pressure behind it and you know, looking at the stability of that thing. So um, this is another thing that people use three deck for. Hydraulic fracturing, um, you also have the ability in 3DEC to simulate fluid flow through the fractures. Um, so you can use this to, to look at hydraulic fracturing and it's fully coupled so that fluid pressures will cause deformations and opening of new fractures and so on. Um, and so this is an example of a horizontal tunnel. Um, it's actually a geothermal example, stimulating some existing fractures and the resulting micro seismicity. So you could look at the slip on these joints and relate that to some sort of seismicity. <clears throat> the waste disposal, another thing that 3DEC has in it is thermal capabilities. So you can um, add a heat source and look at the effect on the, the mechanics and the stability. Um, so people do use this for nuclear waste disposal problems. Dams, often you have a dam on top of some sort of fractured rock material and you want to look at the stability or performance of that. And then other. So there's a whole bunch of other things you could potentially do with 3 deck. Uh, this is just a fun example of a um, an ancient dwelling. This is in Colorado. You can see the top picture there. It's like a, a very very old village essentially built under this rock overhang, and they're quite nervous about the the rock collapsing on top of this thing. So um, there was a 3 deck simulation where they tried to model that, and then what kind of support might be needed to keep this thing standing up. So there are other things you can do with 3 deck like this. Okay, that's it for applications. I think it's time for another poll. Great, thank you, Jim. Okay, so in this poll, uh, we're just asking a little bit about your experience, if any, uh, using 3 deck. So I'm going to close the poll now, and uh, we'll continue with the presentation. Okay, so this is the 
the meat of the presentation, talking about the new features in version nine. Um, okay, the first thing you will notice when you start version nine is it looks different. So the, the user interface is quite a bit different than it used to be in version seven and version five. Um, instead of me talking to this slide, I'll actually just open up the program and show you some things. <clears throat> I should also mention that um, you can get the three deck program without a license, just download it and try some of the tutorials and example problems. Um, there's a, a demo mode where you can run reasonably small models um, just to try it out. So if you feel like doing that, you can do that. Um, OK, so here's deck nine. This is what it looks like. So it looks kind of like the wide layout in previous versions. Um, you've got your main area here, your console down here, your project on the left. The first thing you'll notice is the colors are different. It's a bit of a different color scheme. You'll also probably notice that the icons are different, more consistent. Um, the third thing you'll probably notice is that over here on the left side, we used to have data files and save states. We now also have plots. And so what we've done here is instead of having plots as tabs along the bottom, the plots are listed on the left-hand side here. And this is nice because often people would have 10 or 20 or 100 plots, and you'd have all these tabs along the bottom, and it was almost impossible to find what you were looking for. Now they're just listed down here, and I can go and double-click on one of these things, and it will appear in my working area. Mm -hmm. I can go up here and double-click on the data file and bring it back again. If I want to look at two things at the same time, I can just split the screen here. So there's a little split button. I can say split right. And I can go here and show my plot. And so now I'm looking at the plot and the data file at the same time. Maybe I want to look at two plots. So I can go up here and say split above, put another plot in here, um, something. Um, you, you can keep on splitting these things. You're really kind of only limited by the size of your screen. Um, my screen is not that big, but another thing you can do here is hide these other panels. So down on the left corner, you see these buttons. I can click on project to hide the project panel and click on commands to hide the console. And now I've got more real estate for my, my plots and my data files. And unlike in previous versions, it's actually super easy to bring these things back again. So um, I've, I've lost my commands in my project, but I can just go down here and click on these buttons to bring them back again. Um, and so it's super easy to give yourself more space or not as you may need it. Um, one other cool thing that we've added here, and now let's pretend you've got a bunch of plots. Um, you can right click on this, and we've always had the ability to export bitmaps for individual plots. Now you can export the whole workspace. So what this does is, in this case, I've got three different things shown here, the data file and the two plots. I can export that whole thing to a, to a PNG file. It kind of doesn't make sense when you have a data file, but imagine you have three or four plots. You can export that whole thing into one in one shot, which is kind of useful. OK, let's hide this one. <clears throat> let's hide this one. OK, a couple other things to note that are new. Um, if I go back to my data file here, <clears throat> we've always had this control space, which allows you to uh, sort of complete commands, or at least give you some hints about the commands. So we still got that. So let's pretend I wanted to do something with my grid points. Plot grid point, make this font bigger. <clears throat> I hit control space. What we've got now is a much more sophisticated tree showing you the possible commands. So here I am at block grid point. These are the things I can do with block grid point, apply, group, initialize. But I can also see the whole tree here. So if I actually change my mind and I want to do something else, I can go to somewhere else in the tree and do something else. Um, but let's say I want to do the block grid point. I can click on apply and say insert selection. Let's say I want to force. I can right click on that and say insert selection. And the other thing that's new is that we also have the ranges here. Um, so I want to apply that force over some range. And now I've got a whole list of all the possible ranges I can use, which is super useful. The other thing I can do is get straight to the help in the manual by just right-clicking on this and say, 
give me the reference. And it will open that section of the manual over here on the right hand side. <laughs> so this control space is uh, quite a bit more versatile than it used to be. <laughs> Close that. <clears throat> okay, here's another cool thing. Let's go to a plot now. This is kind of a hidden feature right now, but since you're on the webinar, you can have a sneak peek at it. Um, if you move your mouse around, you can see the information down here on the bottom right. Hopefully you're all familiar with that already. The problem is, as I'm just showing you now, when I move my mouse off the plot, the information disappears. And maybe I want to cut and paste something from there, get the coordinates, I don't know, something. So what you can do is if I press Q, again, this is kind of a hidden feature. We're going to figure out how to make this more discoverable. But for now, um, you go here and you press Q, and the information box appears on the plot and follows you around. And then if I press C for copy, it actually freezes it. And I can go in here and copy and paste stuff from the information, which is pretty cool. <laughs> All right, just a couple other things to show here on, on the, related to plotting. Um, in the past, you've always had the scientific notation in the legend, which depending on what you're trying to plot, can be more <laughs> numbers than you actually want. Um, so I can just change that now. I can go here to legend, uh, contour, and then change it to decimal notation. And I get something like this, which is quite nice. <laughs> the other thing I can do is, um, the other thing we've added is the ability to create your own color ramp. So we've got the usual ones, black and white, red and blue, etc. But you can make a custom ramp here. So I can specify a start color and an end color and things like that. And I can make my own custom color ramp, which is kind of cool. One more thing to show on here. If I go to my uh, block plot, this is showing the failed states of the zones, right? So I've got tension passed, shear passed, shear passed, tension passed. Um, Often you don't care about what these things did in the past, and you only care about the zones that are failing right now. So there's a little click right here where I can say, hide all the stuff that failed in the past, because I don't care about that, and just show the stuff that's failing now. In this case, it's nothing. Um, but you can imagine how this could be useful. OK, I think that's all I'm going to show here. I will bring the um, PowerPoint back up. Okay, so here's what I was just talking about, user-defined contour ramp, format and precision of the legends, omit the past states. Um, a couple other things I didn't show, you can swap axes to the table in the profile. So maybe, you know, by default, it's showing uh, depth on the bottom, but you want depth to be on the left side, so you can just hit a swap. Um, you can add minor grid lines to the charts. Um, one thing here that's 3 deck specific that is very useful is that the, most of the plot items are now multi-threaded. That did not used to be the case in version 7 and before. Um, so depending on the speed of your computer and how many cores you have and so on, um, plotting can be quite a lot faster than it used to be. OK, and so then related to that, um, possibly the most attractive thing for people going to version 9 is improving the performance in certain categories. Um, so what we've done here is increase the speed to reaching the steady state solution. So often you're doing a model solve command to try and get to the steady state solution. Um, and you sit around and wait for some thousands of steps for that to occur. Uh, we've done some work on here to speed up getting to that steady state. So depending on the problem, um, this could be actually up to 10 times faster than it used to be. This same sort of uh, logic also affects the dynamic time step. And so again, depending on the problem, you can have quite a bit larger dynamic time steps. Um, other things related to performance, the save and restore has been sped up. Um, it's quite a bit faster than it used to be in version seven. 
and I already mentioned the multi-threaded plotting. Here's just an example. This is the supported tunnel example that's in the manual. Um, it's just a tunnel with a discrete fracture network. Um, you, you build this thing and you want to cycle to steady state. In version seven, this took almost 28,000 steps. And in version nine, it took about 3,000 steps. So almost 10 times faster to get to the steady state. And you can see that the results are basically exactly the same. Um, dynamics, again, it depends on the problem, but this is a, a dam with a, again, with a discrete fracture network in it. Um, you can see that the time step in version nine is about three times bigger than it used to be in version seven. Okay, that's all I'm gonna say about performance. The next topic is about nonlinear structural elements. So if you've used version seven or version five, um, you will know that you can put in liners, but the liners are always elastic. So you specify a Young's modulus, you specify a Poisson's ratio, but they never fail. Um, we've now added the ability to have failing liners. Um, they can go plastic. Um, the constitutive models that are possible to assign to the liners are more Coulomb, strain softening more Coulomb, or a new one, von Mies, which is mostly used for uh, modeling metals. Here's just a super simple example. This is just a, a liner simply supported being subjected to a, a, a force in the middle pushing upwards. So this is a graph showing the applied pressure against the center deflection. Let's play it again. So what you can see, it starts off elastic. So you got a nice straight line. Then stuff starts to fail. And what's interesting here is that it fails progressively, right? So some of these are less than 80%. And then you get to the point where some of them are greater than 80%. This is a fairly realistic simulation of the way these things fail. You can imagine bending a liner. You have high tension on one side and high compression on the other side. It doesn't fail across the whole thickness at the same time. You can have this progressive failure where it starts on the tension side and then progresses down to the compression side. And so that's what this actually does. <laughs> Here's a slightly more realistic example. This is a lined subway tunnel. They built the tunnel with the liner and then they excavate this shaft fairly close by. Um, they're interested in what's going to happen to the tunnel. Um, you can see here that this on the left, this is an exaggerated deformation. It doesn't actually bulge out that much. You know, the actual bulge is on the order of two or three centimeters. But um, you can see here on the left side, this is with an elastic liner like you might do in version seven. On the right hand side, you could specify some strength properties for this liner and this thing actually fails. What you'll see is it's not actually failing, it failed in the past. But even failing in the past changes the, the path and the stress redistribution and so on. And so you get more deformation here, you know, up to maybe five centimeters of deformation in this case, um, because we've allowed this liner to, to potentially fail. Same model, you're looking at the surface settlement, you know, they excavate this tunnel, how much settlement are they seeing? Um, again, the elastic liner, maybe two centimeters of settlement. When you have this nonlinear liner, maybe three centimeters of settlement. <laughs> okay, next topic. Um, there's a, a new constitutive, a couple of new constitutive models. I already mentioned Von Mies. Um, there's another one, concrete plastic damage model. So if you're actually modeling concrete blocks, um, this is a fairly sophisticated model that has. Um, it sort of damage criterion in it. So this sort of progression of damage. It also has a modulus degradation. So you can see that the stress strain curve is potentially curved because you have changing modulus. Um, I'm certainly not gonna get into all the details here, but it's a, a fairly sophisticated model for simulating concrete. This is a, a relatively simple test of a concrete beam subjected to some point loads. It's actually got cables inside of it for extra support. Um, it uses the concrete constitutive model. So you can see here the contours are showing shear strain. So you can see these areas of high shear strain, these correspond to the areas of damage in this thing. Um, and you get a fairly realistic behavior bending this joint. Again, this uh, deformation is exaggerated, but um, you get the idea. These plots, these graphs here at the top and the bottom are essentially 
part of the calibration um, where we're picking the properties of the concrete model to match lab studies, um, which is shown by the triangles. Another constitutive model is the columnar basalt constitutive model. And uh, this, this was developed to try and model these types of columnar basalts. Um, you see these uh, in, in China where they are building some of these giant dams. Um, so we were trying to figure out a way to model these things. What it is is essentially the, an enhanced ubiquitous joint model. So you may be familiar with the ubiquitous joint model where you can have one plane of weakness essentially. Um, in this case, you can have up to four planes of weakness. So it's similar to the ubiquitous joint model, but you can have four different planes of weakness um, and get some pretty rich and interesting behavior. Um, okay, next topic, improved join logic. So in the past, um, all the joining was block-based. And what that, what that means is that a bunch of blocks always had to join together to form a bigger block. And that was necessary because in the past, people were often doing rigid block analysis. And you need to have a contiguous block to calculate the moments of inertia and things like that. Um, in the modern day world, a lot of people are doing deformable blocks. And so that's not important anymore. We don't calculate moments of inertia for these deformable blocks. You used to have to have block based joining so that all the blocks form contiguous pieces. That is no longer true. We can have contact based joining, which means that um, you don't have to have contiguous pieces that are joined together. And as far as the user is concerned, what this means is that when I create construction joints and then I create new joints, it does not cause the construction joints to become unjoined, which was necessary in the past to form these contiguous blocks is no longer necessary because we have this contact-based joining. And so it just allows you to run models that are more efficient because we don't have to worry about these things that became unjoined. You can now couple 3 deck to FLAC 3D. Um, and so what I was pointing out here is you can, you can see this is a 3 deck model in the middle with these bonded blocks, a FLAC 3D model on the outside. The grid points do not need to line up. It's intelligent enough to do some interpolation, um, but they do need to have a, a matching boundary here. Okay, so this is the last slide. Um, we updated Python version 3.10. It is now easier to add your own Python packages. Um, if there's something that you want that we don't include, that's relatively easy to add it. Um, we've added a new type of structural element, these Timoshenko beams. Um, if you're interested in that kind of stuff, then you know what they are. We've added the ability to specify a log normal distribution for the sizes of a discrete fracture network. And so you can see here um, that kind of looks like a normal distribution, but it's skewed. And this is a lot of people like to use this for um, discrete fracture networks. And they used to try and do it with fish, which is quite painful. Um, now it's just built in. Um, this last part here, this is a company called Rockmass that uh, has an instrumentation for doing mapping. And so they can map surfaces and fractures and things like that. And so we've uh, added the ability to import data that they output. And so this plot on the bottom is showing three sections of a tunnel, um, the surface of the tunnel in gray, and then the fractures in red. And once you import that, you could do something with it, you know, cut them into three deck or whatever. And then lastly, we've added a bunch of new examples and plan to add even more examples in future updates. Okay, there we go. All right, now Dave, you wanna to talk to this one? Sure, Jim. We will be uh, distributing the video recording for, uh, for the presentation today. So that'll be on our YouTube channel and you'll be able to find it uh, on our uh, website as well. And anybody who's registered for the, for the webinar will receive a, a link to that. Uh, we will also include a PDF version of the PowerPoint, so these useful links will actually be interactive. Uh, just links back to the main page. There's a section on what's new, 
Uh, we have our software academy, which we're adding um, more and more training courses to, so that you can uh, do uh, on-demand online training. Some uh, have a fee, and a lot are also free. Uh, just a reminder that we have a software forum, um, and there's a link to that. Just so that uh, if you have any questions, of course, we provide technical support, but uh, it's always interesting to see what other people are asking. Um, if you're registered with the forum, you're also able to uh, make suggestions and answers of your own. It's a good place to, to go uh, when you're, especially when you're learning or you have a particular problem. Uh, if you, and then there'll be a link to uh, request a quote. And just to let you uh, know that we currently have, uh, through February 23rd, a uh, discount of 20% uh, using the 3 dac 9 uh, coupon code. Um, so it's a, a good time if you're looking um, to uh, purchase and you want uh, some savings. So the next slide, I think, is the poll. So I'm just we're going to run this last poll, and it's just asking uh, what you might be looking forward to in 3 dac 9 and of course, on this one, you can pick more than one uh, option. So thank you all very much for participating. Uh, I'm going to close the poll now, and uh, we'll move on to questions and answers. If you have oh. any questions, sorry. I was going to say one thing. Uh, hopefully, you can still hear me. But um, yeah. the bond, the 64% interested in bonded blocks. I did forget to mention one new feature because we added it very recently, which was the ability to suppress vertex-vertex contacts in these bonded block models. So um, I don't have a slide, but when people make these models with like 10,000 tetrahedral blocks in them, all these tetrahedra come together at the points and you end up with millions of these vertex-vertex contacts that really have almost no effect on the behavior of the model. So, um, we added a flag so that you could basically suppress those contacts, and this speeds up the model maybe 20% and also reduces your memory use about 20% because um, it's not worrying about all those contacts that are basically doing nothing. So that's another cool thing for bonded block model. And Jim, also the uh, non-uniform Voronice. Right. Um, yeah, the ability to easily create or easy fill a volume with tetrahedra and give them some distribution of sizes um, so that you, you you don't have a, a crystalline type of packing, you know, you have something that's a bit more random. So yeah, that's in there too. And there's actually an example of showing both of those things um, in the manual. So you can go and look at it, even though I don't have a slide here. Okay, Great. questions. <laughs> Uh, so, um, in terms of questions, we have a few that people have submitted. Uh, if you have any, please feel free to type them in, or uh, if you click on raising your hand, I will uh, see that and we can open up your mic if you'd like. So, Jim, uh, first question, what are the main applications for OpenPit Mines? And then the second part of that question, is this software 3DAC um, better than FLAC? Flack 3D. Yep. Um, yeah, like I showed earlier, a lot of people do mine scale problems with this. Um, for open pit mines, you know, the, the, the deformation and the problems in open pit mines are often controlled by the structures. And by that, I mean like the faults and the joints. Um, so the ability to put in a whole bunch of faults and joints, especially intersecting faults and joints into these open pit models. Uh, makes this a pretty good choice for open pit model mining at the at the pit scale. Um, and the fact that you can have deformable blocks that themselves can fail um, you know means that that you can you can also see uh, deformation or failure through the through the rock mass between the joints. Um, so a lot of people do this for pit scale open pit mines. Um, I did show that example of like the bench scale. Uh, I think that's probably less common. Um, but it's certainly possible to do that kind of stuff too. Um, the question about whether it's better than FLAC, it really depends on how many discontinuities you're trying to model. Um, so it is possible to model discontinuities in FLAC 3D. Um, if you don't have that many of them, it's challenging to create the, 
the mesh and the model when you have a whole bunch of faults and fractures. Um, the thing that 3 deck allows you to do is just cut them in there. You can say, okay, I want a joint set with some spacing, and I want another joint set with some other spacing and some other orientation, and just goes ching, 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 and cuts them all in, and then you zone it. Um, so building the model is quite a lot easier in, um, in 3 deck if you have a whole bunch of intersecting joints. And the contact mechanics are a little bit more accurate in 3 deck um, than they are in Flag 3D, again, because this is sort of designed for those types of problems as opposed to flag 3D, which is more of a continuum program, if that makes sense. <laughs> Great, thank you. Um, we had a question, you showed a uh, tunnel stability example uh, a couple of times, the same example, different views, uh, when you were, had the user interface up, um, yeah. and the uh, person is just asking if that's in the, in the uh, library, in the example files, which I believe yep, it is. Yep, it's there, yep, it's in the manual. Okay. Uh, that same person was wondering if there was a one fault in seismicity example. Oh, that's a good question. Um, I know lots of people do that kind of stuff where they have a single fault and they're injecting and they want to look at the slip. Um, there's not an example in the manual that shows the resulting seismicity. Without getting into too much detail, part of the problem is that the it's, it's not actually clear how to define the seismicity. I mean, in that plot I showed earlier, we're basically just taking the shear displacement and multiplying by modulus and area and coming up with a moment. But um, there are various reasons why that's not a, a perfect approach for simulating seismicity. So I think it's a good point. And maybe what I'll try and do is add something to the manual that is a relatively simple approach for calculating seismicity for some sort of injection into a fault. So yeah, it's not there right now, but it would be relatively easy to add that. So. <laughs> yeah, and, and if I could just add, one of the nice things about 3DAC is it has a, a number of advanced uh, contact models um, that sort of line up nicely with, I think, that kind of work. So uh, next question, uh, just a comment uh, in terms of of code and facility to use, there have been a lot of changes, um, and uh, someone is asking in terms of an upgrade. So uh, we'll send you an email, and we'll just talk to you offline about that, and uh, we can we can help you with that. So thank you for your comment. And then the last question is uh, thanks for the presentation. It would be nice to open mesh meshing solutions, uh, e.g., by passing uh, coordinates, connectivity maps that were exported from other meshing tools. Do you think that it could be a possible thing in the future? Um, it depends on the details. I mean, you do right now have the ability to import from Griddle. Um, if you wanted a different format, you know, if you had some other meshing tool, you, you would have to put it into the format that it's expecting, uh, which is, you know, the format that Griddle exports. Um, it's not that complicated. I mean, it's grid points and uh, blocks and zones and faces, um, and it's all described in the manual. So I guess the short answer is, yeah, it's possible to import meshes created by other programs. Um, you just have to put them in the right format. That makes sense. <clears throat> right, so for example, uh, Griddle Runs is a plugin for Rhino 3D, which is a, a CAD program. So any format that you can import uh, into Rhino, um, you know, DXF or, or whatever, um, then of course you'd have to clean it up in Rhino and, and, and uh, remesh it, uh, and then you could simply export it as a, a 3D or a FLAC 3D model, uh, including all the interfaces, all the discontinuities, and those, uh, those actually get retained in the, uh, the grid file, so as soon as you bring it into 3 deck, it already knows that those are, are joints and I can have group names assigned to it for easy property assignment. And then um, there is both an ASCII uh, grid file format and a, um, I'm gonna say the wrong word, uh, not digital, but a, a binary. binary. Yeah, thanks, Jim. Uh, and so if you actually look at the ASCII version of the data file, it's very logically laid out. Like Jim was saying, it's all sort of connect to uh, connectivity. Uh, so you would be able to write uh, a fish program or a Python function or some other uh, tool um, 
probably even in Excel. Uh, if you can get it in that format, uh, then 3 deck will just recognize it right away. Uh, I'll also just add to that. In the old days, like version 5.2 and before, you could only import blocks. Now you can import blocks and zones. So if you have something that creates the zones, then you can import that as well, which is nice. Great. All right, I'm not seeing any hands raised and there are no more questions in the queue. So uh, I'd like to thank everybody for uh, participating, for joining us today. Again, apologize for the technical uh, issues. Um, we will be uh, posting the recording of the webinar, the uh, slideshow, um, and we will follow up with some people uh, who had specific questions. Um, but uh, thank you very much for your attention and I uh, hope you enjoy uh, either trying or using uh, 3DAC version 9. Have a good day, everybody.